Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm giving a, a brief talk on how to use units in your APIs, mainly uh, for DSP processors to kind of enforce type correctness and, and kind of reduce boilerplate code. And I have some examples. If you, if you want to download them, they're at the URL. The QR code uh, points to that URL. So I'll leave the slide up for a second. Seems like. OK. So um, just a little bit about me. I'm a musician, and I, I got hooked on making audio software in college. And, and so it's kind of turned from something mythical that only really weird people in basements can do to you know something that I, I do full time, which is great. I mainly release plugins through my company, SignCure Audio. And currently, I live in Berlin, where I've been working with uh, Robert Henke on his 8032AV project. So I've been writing sound routines in, in uh, 6502 assembly for most of the year. So if you want to know what that's like, come and ask. Um, what is a unit? So anyone want to throw out some answers? Pop quiz time. Ooh. <laughs> Uh, so a, a standard measure of a, a quantity, yeah. So what does that, what does that actually mean? Um, so it, basically, if you think of, of normal numbers that you have in your APIs, your ints, your, your floats, uh, there are ways of representing a number on a computer. But a unit is actually a, a, not only a representation of a number, but it's also a representation of um, some physical thing as well. And so to, to have a, a full unit type, you need not only the value, but you also need what physical thing that that value is tied to. So why would you want to, to use these in your code? You know, ints and, and floats kind of work everywhere. Um, but there are kind of a, a few compelling reasons. Um, if, you, if you use unit types, you get clearer API semantics. Um, no longer do you, do you have like uh, parameters that are time or time in seconds. Your actual parameter type is seconds. Um, and so that gives you type safety. And also, if you have um, types that can convert between each other, similar units that, that have conversions, um, you can automatically convert from one type of unit to another. So you can um, not have to, to convert yourself just by passing a similar unit into a function. You can have it convert for you. Um, and that, that kind of lets you clear up a lot of boilerplate, and it um, makes uh, your, your code easier to read. So how do, you, how do you implement this? How do you practically achieve this? Um, there are several existing solutions. You have boost.units, you have units. Um, and none of them kind of really uh, do what you would want to do in this sort of scenario. They're all really uh, well featured, but part of that is you have to, to set them up, and um, it's not super clear on, on how to make your own units a lot of the time uh, that you can use in your own APIs. Um, and, and so it's, it's kind of like a little, little too much for, for just doing simple stuff. If you need to, to use units in, in large um, kind of matrix calculations and, and stuff where you actually want to convert inside of your math, then those things are more appropriate. Um, so Juice has a, a decibel class. What about extending that? Um, and the thing with the decibel class is that it doesn't actually hold a value. It, it just holds conversion functions. And so even though it is a, a decibel class, it isn't really a, a unit um, in that sense. So I've made a uh, simple unit kind of base class that I've, I've uh, put in a library on GitHub. It's in the examples from the beginning of the talk. It's a single header. And it, it uses just a, a simple CRTP base class that holds a value, defines all arithmetic and bit shifting operators for it, um, that then uh, under, uh, operate on the, the underlying type of the unit. So units can be um, attached to some physical process, but they can also be ints and floats as well. And, and so 
when you do arithmetic, you're, you're operating on that underlying value. Derived classes inherit from this and define conversions primarily. Um, but then you can also re-implement the um, arithmetic operators and, and the bit shifting if you wanted to, so that if you have a, a unit that doesn't uh, kind of follow regular um, arithmetic semantics, you can still accommodate that. Um, and inside the library, there's some different specializations for, for decibels and amplitude and resonance and, and Q. So let's look at an example. This is uh, some version of a, a decibel unit. And it has a, a, a few different constructors, one for uh, dealing with other decibels, copy constructor, and then another one that um, lets you make decibels from, from kind of normal, uh, uh, like the, the included types in, in C++, like int and, and float. Um, it's been declared explicit, and so what that means is that you can't actually say, I have a decibel of some quantity, and um, I want to assign to it. You, you have to actually say, um, make, explicitly say, this is a, a decibel of, of whatever type. Um, and then it defines a, a conversion from amplitude to decibel. The amplitude class defines the reverse conversion, and then can be constructed through that conversion from an amplitude and vice versa. So let's take a, a look in practice. You have um, an amplitude and a, a decibel, and, and as you can see, you can kind of convert from one to the other. Um, and you can output them, and as you see, if you set decibel equal to an amplitude of 0.5, it outputs negative 60 B, which is the, the uh, conversion for uh, amplitude of 0.5 to a decibel. Um, but then you can also do some, some kind of other stuff. You can, if you add two uh, decibels together, for example, it outputs um, zero dB, which might seem odd because um, if, if each half power amplitude is, is 0.7 and when you convert that to a decibel, it's 0.3, uh, negative 0.3, or sorry, it's negative three. Negative three and negative three don't sum to zero. So how do you do something like that? You can overload the um, operators of the class um, to, to achieve kind of some custom arithmetic. Um, in this case, since decibels operate on a logarithmic scale, you have to use um, logarithmic addition when you want to add them. And then if you want to multiply them, you just add them linearly. Um, and that gives you the, the kind of power and, and flexibility to change um, how your units respond in, in conversion and then when interacting with each other. So let's look at, at some more practical examples with uh, envelopes and, and filters. Um, so, you know, kind of, I guess, one of the age-old debates is when you make an envelope, do you want it to use seconds or do you want it to use milliseconds? Um, and why not have both? So C++ comes with std chrono, um, and it has several different specializations. So it has seconds, milliseconds, um, and, and many more. And you might think, oh, well, I, I just take some amount of seconds and I add in 3.2, and it doesn't compile, because you can only assign um, an integral value to a, a chrono by default. So what you have to do is you have to instead use std chrono duration. Um, and duration lets you specify two things. It lets you specify the underlying type of the duration. So um, you can specify a floating point type and then have floating point values as the underlying type. And then for the second argument, you specify um, a ratio. And by default, that's one to one. So um, that gives you seconds, but it can be uh, other things. So you can you can define uh, std milli, or you can use std milli, or um, which is an alias for std ratio of one one thousandth, um, and that lets you have milliseconds. And you can do wacky things like decaseconds and and kiloseconds. But the important thing is that you can um, convert between these automatically. So if you have a, a time in seconds and you make it a time in milliseconds, um, it becomes 
1,000 times, the, the, the actual underlying value becomes 1,000 times greater because 1,000 milliseconds make up one second. So you can kind of piece together how to make a, a pretty simple ADSR class with this. Um, this is just kind of an example um, declaration for uh, a class. And you can set the sample rate, and you can set the attack time, the decay time, release time, and the sustain gain. Um, and these kind of all, all work the way you would expect. But the nice um, thing about it is that you don't have to worry about am I passing in seconds, am I passing in milliseconds, or, or the, the right value. The type encodes that information. And so you can be sure that even if the type that you pass is different than the type, um, the, the duration that you pass is different than the duration that the object wants to operate on, you'll automatically convert between the two. And, and so you'll still get the correct behavior. So resonance and Q. Um, this is a, a, just an example of a resonance coefficient class, um, really similar to the decibel. Um, and in use, one of the more interesting things you can do with this is if you wanted to, to add kind of this unit stuff to, to your juice DSP objects, you can wrap the um, state variable filter parameters class, um, which is what this does. And, and very simply, it has two overloads. And one of them uh, uses a, a unit type for Q. And one of them uses just a standard uh, numeric type. And if you hit the, uh, if, you, if you don't use the standard numeric type, uh, it forwards, well, that no, doesn't forward, but it uh, gives all of the, the arguments to the um, underlying parameters um, object and um, then normally sets the cutoff frequency as, as you would if you use the state variable filters parameter uh, class by itself. But if you try to, to not use unit types, it, it asserts. And so you can kind of use this to, to enforce uh, and, and similar concepts to in, enforce using units in your code. Um, and then you can, because this derives from state variable filters parameters, you can um, pass it to a state variable filter and um, like, like this. So ultimately, a lot of this is, is cool, but why would you want to use unit types when all of your parameters in the end, uh, if you use kind of a parameter tree, are bools or ints or floats or strings? Um, you know, you might have all of this enforced type checking in your DSP classes, but it doesn't really do anything for you if um, you still have to convert uh, to and, and from the parameter tree. So one of the other things I've made is a kind of, um, parameter class called audio parameter unit. And this is a um, subclass of, well, it's, it's three different subclasses. And one of them is for ints, and one of them is for floats, and one of them is, for some reason, if you really wanted to, booleans. And the idea is you choose the um, kind of underlying type like you normally do. That's the second parameter. In this case, it's float. And the first parameter is the unit type that you want to represent. And the idea is that you, you make these as you would any other parameter. Um, and because everything is a subclass of ranged audio parameter, um, you can pass these into your audio parameter uh, tree as normal. Um, but the, the cool, one of the cool things you can do is get the values out without having to, to convert back from um, float. So using two different examples, we have ADSR parameters. Um, and the ADSR parameters, by default, takes uh, floating point values for the attack, decay, release, and sustain values. Um, if you want to get the normal um, kind of underlying type back, you can use get raw parameter value. And it'll return the, the int or the float or the bool. But if you want to get the um, normal uh, unit type back, then you can cast the uh, parameter that you get out of the tree to the parameter type. And uh, the uh, operator of its type has been overloaded. And so it will return the um, 
the, the typed value that you want. And so you can use this to, to still have the, the normal behavior that you have with existing audio code um, and, and the, the kind of regular types, but you can also get the um, same behavior now with unit types. Um, so that is my talk. Questions? Much. Uh, and all I felt through that was regret that we didn't do all that stuff in Juice years ago. <laughs> we, we absolutely should. Um, any questions? Uh, who's first? Tom at the back. Um, I've been working a lot with musical time or sequences and things like this, and I was wondering if you've considered you, um, you know, more exotic numeric types. Well, it's not really exotic, but just a, a normal fractional number, for example, uh, because you can represent, um, you know, a third without losing any precision, for example, very useful when we're dealing with musical time or musical ratios. Right, so. Have you considered like ha whether that would fit into this system, if that's possible, if you could have a, if you could create yeah, a rational well, type and embed it into a, into a unit? Yeah, I haven't uh, done that and I haven't really considered it, but the reason is because the standard library provides a uh, stood ratio. And so if you, if you want to have two rational numbers that, and that express a fraction, uh, you could just use that. Um, but it's, it's the same sort of concept, right? You're representing not a floating point value, but a ratio between two numbers. I suppose the question then is when it gets converted to a, oh. a double at what point, but... Um but yeah, uh, no, it, no, I, I didn't catch that. Ratio. Sorry, was that your question? No, no, that or wasn't or his question. That was that was my question. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> but but Wait, it was more uh, like you know you don't we don't know when that would happen. So right. But at some point it would probably end up being a double. right. And and so you would need to write your your kind of underlying code to accept a ratio in yeah. and then convert yeah. it whenever is it yeah. appropriate. If you can keep it ratios all the way. Right. right. But, uh, so uh, there was a question over here that just got pipped at the post. I think it's a really valuable approach of having the strong typing. Um, I was wondering whether you've thought about taking it to the next step of using tagged types as well, where you've got, you, ha you just declare an arbitrary struct, um, you know, meters tag and so on, similar to how the stud chrono things work, I think. Um, so then that means that you can actually do things like define different time <coughs> domains. So you could, for instance, have parameters attack, decay, release, sustain but have it so that if this is a function that takes eight parameters, you can't accidentally use the sustain one in, in, um, in the place of the attack. I mean, uh, we wrote, uh, we kind of started our new code base a number of years ago, and we used that tag type, and especially for IDs, and I think you know, seven years ago, it was one of the best decisions that we made, I think. Um, so I guess we so, um in in this context, if you try to use a, a decibel value, I mean, this is this is how I personally use it. I represent all of the um, time types as chronos, and then the the sustain as a decibel. And if you try to convert from a decibel to a time type, it says I don't know how to do that. There's no conversion operator defined. So I don't really use tag types in that context, but I, I do use things that you you can't convert between basically, to, to enforce that you're semantically doing the correct thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that certainly gets you kind of a lot of the way. I think you could, that there's also the possibility of having the tag would kind of, yeah. that you can distinguish between different time domains, for instance. Even though the units are the same, mm -hmm. the meaning of them may be different. One of them may be relative to the current frame. Mm -hmm. One of them may be relative to your kind of overall start time. Right. Hi, um, it's Jeremy here. Um, I, my current challenge is I'm building a UI framework uh, that allows people to design configuration panels for uh, hardware chips, uh, DSPs, and so forth. Uh, and um, kind of a actually at the stage of, of adding unit support at this time. With your types, would you include uh, the kind of to string function that the UI would use and know where to put the prefixes and the suffixes, or or would you keep that logic outside of the the numerical types themselves? 
Right. Um, I thought about that, and and I didn't really come to a decision. I didn't include it, um, but I would like to. And the main thing is just do how how does that work um, when there isn't a sensible kind of string to give to a unit? Um, do you do you just have the the base value be an empty string? Um, but then does it make sense to have things be empty strings? Um, and so I haven't included that, but it's it's definitely something I'm thinking of. Um, and and I have had it so that if you um, well no yeah that's because yeah, I, I mean that's this this tricky case like decibels themselves you know you end up at infinity rather than zero right you have to figure out how are you going to represent that are you going to do it graphically with the sideways kind of figure of eight infinity and how that kind of fits into what what font encoding scheme and, and exactly a bunch of stuff like that so. yeah yeah okay thank you. Any more questions on this side? Yeah. I just want to build up on the past question uh, mm -hmm. because I always find myself writing big if codes. Uh, for, for example, I have hertz frequency, and if it's small, I, I print it with you know, two, two, two commas, two after comma. Then if it's big, I, I write kilohertz. And, and then in, on the inverse, uh, I, I make uh, some some translation from text to value, trying to uh, understand what the user is going to write. So your code made me think of some kind of terse construction that would allow me to, you know, define sub ranges where there's some representation when I do it to a string. Just uh, just an idea. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Any, uh, one at the back. Thank um, you. Yeah, so I deal with a lot of MIDI, um, and I find quite often that when I'm dealing with MIDI notes, I translate them into a different range of MIDI notes so I can transpose them up and down. And when working in that way, I, I put asserts in a sensible place just to make sure I don't index into an array wrong. But it'd be really great if I have that range information within the type. And I just wonder if that's anything you've wondered about as well, and if you have any solutions for that. Sorry, I didn't catch the, the middle part of that question. Um, so to basically, if you have if you have your standard MIDI note to, because you you'll use a byte for it, but the mm -hmm. top half of that byte will be useless because it's not actually a sensible range. So yeah. as soon as you put a value into that uh, MIDI note uh, class or struct, whatever it is, um, to tell you that it's going out of range, um, and if that's something that you've also encountered in the types you've working with. You've, you've mentioned time, which I guess yeah. doesn't apply there. But um, So I haven't really considered that. And the the main reason is because, to me, that's that's kind of more abstract than what a, a unit is about. I think that's, uh, unless I'm misunderstanding, more about um, kind of making sure that you only access the right parts of a byte if the value is something you only want to do that to. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I've thought about that, but not in this context. Um, because to me, I, uh, that's not really what I think of when I think of like units. Um, yeah, OK. But yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. OK, we've got um, the first over here, I think. Sorry. Thank you. Um, have you worked at, m at all with flicks, or do you know what flicks are? The uh, no. OK, then my question wouldn't be real. It's something defined by, I think it was Facebook, Oculus. Has anyone else heard of Flix? It's a, just a type that's highly divis divisible by very standard uh, ratios. So anyone interested, they, they use standard Kronos. And I was curious if you had worked with that specific number or type at all. OK, well, then I don't have any further questions. <laughs> Sounds interesting, then. Uh, there was a question over here. Um, So uh, say you're designing an API, and you incorporate a uh, unit uh, a framework or a library for unit encoding. Uh, <clears throat> could you consider that as being like final? Or do you think this is like something that is progressively developing on how to encode in the units? I'm thinking of stability of an API. So mm. essentially, you don't want to break the API incorporating new versions and so. 
So is is that a question about my unit library or units no, in general? It's a question about your library, maybe okay. standardization or just your reflections mm -hmm. about stability of API sure. in regards to unit. Uh, yeah, so it's pretty, um, like it, it doesn't actually do much, right? It's it's really just this one class and, and it just um, holds a value and um, it, it takes in a type like a, a, a abstract type, uh, not an abstract type, but a, a kind of like template type and an underlying value. And it, um, right, and, and it just defines operators for, for kind of having two units interact with each other. And so I don't really see myself changing that because there, there isn't really a lot of behavior there. It's kind of just a default setting and then if you want to, to change the behavior of operators, you can do that. And it, it was really just put in because, you know, if you have two units and you want to add them or subtract them, it would make sense if they work together. But beyond that, most of what I, I use it for is, you know, the conversions and the type checking. And that's already there um, based on, on how you subclass the, the unit in general and based on, um, how you you use your types, and and so it's kind of up to you more how it changes over time. I don't see it changing in my code. Great, we're out of time, um, so it's lunchtime now. So go and mingle and eat, and uh, let's say thanks again once more to to Mark for that great talk. <laughs>